offer? Um, I think most of you know um, what the New Mexico Technology Council is and what we do. We're a statewide member-led organization dedicated to supporting New Mexico's tech ecosystem through networking, professional development, public policy advocacy, workforce, and targeted promotion of our wonderful members. We have monthly peer groups. Our signature events are Women in Technology, our Women in Technology Awards, which we had this summer, um, recognizing over 100 women in outstanding STEM careers and our Experience IT Conference. And um, a little bit, and, and I mentioned public policy and um, member promotions and features. We always wanna thank our community partners who we couldn't do this without. We're so appreciative of our community partners and all of our member organizations. We continue, our lives are events. And so we continue to have some really exciting things that you'd be interested in. Tomorrow, we actually have an uh, Air Force Research Labs virtual tour, which is really exciting. Typically, it's a, a challenge to try to get all of us on the base and actually go for a tour. So please join us. Um, our Women in Technology Happy Hour will be Thursday the 26th. And uh, Women in 3D Printing will be September 8th. Our cyber, next cybersecurity peer group, September 9th. And then we're super excited to have in October, our next um, big data and AI peer group will be with our one and only infamous, brilliant, good friend to the Tech Council who we can always count on to come upstairs and help us out when we need it, Bruce Pitt with Mountain Vector Energy. You can always see all of our events on our website and keep track of us there. So mark your calendar. We're working on our Experience IT annual conference. Um, that'll be Thursday, November 4th. We're planning on embassy suites at Albuquerque and probably needing to do hybrid. So let's just all pray that this Delta variant will go, will go away so we can um, have a great event. We're planning on having a great event anyway. It's always been a wonderful, great networking, great topics. And so mark your calendar. Um, we've already got some great sponsors that'll be supporting this event, as you can see. And thank you so much for Mary for all your hard work reaching out to these folks. Join our mailing list. If you're not on our mailing list, um, Emily's going to put that in the chat and that'll just keep you updated on all the great things that our members are doing and follow us on social media. We're here to help you help your businesses help facilitate connections and just build relationships across our uh, technology community. Um, as, so Michael at Maestas is our chair. We have a great big data and I, I peer group committee and we just wanna thank you all so much for everything you do to help us put these programs on. And now I'm gonna turn it over right before Swami starts, I was gonna, I'm gonna turn it over to Tony and see if you'd like to add anything to um, Swami's wonderful introduction. Well, Swami clearly knows Swami better than Tony does, but I have known him for quite a long time. And uh, basically, if you want someone that understands actually the science behind this, but also understands how to put it in practice and doesn't take a narrow focus, but takes a broad focus on how it applies to an organization, you're just not going to do better than Swami. So uh, with that, um, why don't we turn it over to Swami? Thanks, Tony. You've always been very kind to me. Um, and thanks for that. So can I share my uh, screen? Uh, how do I do that? Do I have to get privileges? Do I have to be made a presenter or something? Let me see. I'm making you a co-host, then you should be able to share. Do you see it now? There you go. I do. Okay, great. Oh, 
Okay. So again, um, thanks, thanks for the time today. So the topic for today is operationalizing and scaling trusted AI. Um, I'll, I'll try to set the basics in terms of um, some of the basic AI concepts, but more focused on, okay, you, you've got AI, you've got a model built, so what, right? Um, putting AI to work is a completely different ball game than how you actually train and build it. And uh, because along with it comes a lot of uh, uh, challenges and, uh, and, and, and important things that you need to take care of. So we'll go through all of that and I'll try to make it a bit interactive. So we'll do a couple of demos in terms of things we have done um, and kind of bring it to life rather than making it too abstract, um, right? So we'll start about why we need to do these because what is, what is happening from surveys and what the industries and leaders are saying there. Uh, we'll do a couple of demos and then I'll spend a lot of time around this modern and trusted AI life cycle and kind of methodically go through, right? What does it mean to kind of address some of the challenges you would face, especially when it comes to scaling? And then um, what do you evaluate? What do you look for? What are some things you can do to overcome? And then also talk about what are some tools and um, platforms and libraries that are out there, um, open source and commercial, right? that are getting traction and are being used uh, to address them. So um, I don't have to say this, AI is all around us, right? And everything from um, how we uh, interact with our daily devices, be it Alexa or Siri or Google Home, or how we watch things on TV. When you go to Netflix, it recommends movies for you based on watching history, not only of yours, but your peer group or whether it is in the in, or when you shop at your favorite e-commerce retailer or when you come into the, in, into the uh, enterprise space, whether it is about uh, assessing risk on loans that you apply for, or whether it is around uh, compliance issues with respect to a contract that you may be signing with a third party, or whether it is um, how you hire the best candidate because your AI is being used to in hiring and recruiting. So it's all around us. So we know that, right? But there is always to be, uh, to do good, right? All of us in, uh, I'm pretty sure, I'm very convinced, all of us uh, at, at the bottom of our heart, we want to do good, right? We want to do what is right for, for us, what is right for the community, what is right for the country and be whatnot. So when, when KPMG goes, we do this every year, we go and talk to uh, different clients that we serve across the world. And uh, we ask them for, uh, various things, right? And one of the things we did a couple of years ago, right, just before the pandemic was, what are the trends that they're seeing with respect to AI? Uh, there were eight trends that we had to summarize. I'm not gonna go through all of them, but kind of point out a couple of them. Uh, two of the trends that was universal with all of the clients we heard was, um, there is one thing about building AI, but when you, there's governance that is needed because you don't want people going and building things and not knowing what it does. It's, it's being a black box and it kind of comes back to hurt me, my reputation and adds risk to what I do. Um, there was also another trend where they were also concern, concerned about ethics. Um, many a times back at that time, there were many AI systems that got shut down because it was biasing against, for example, women or it was biasing against people who did not have a college degree when they were getting applied, when they were applying for a particular job, which you didn't have to have a college degree for that matter. So there was growing focus on how do I bring in, um, how do I make sure this is done in an ethical way? How do I bring in more controls? At the same time, not strifle innovation um, and, and, and be whatnot. So the, these were two important things that clients were very, very, um, uh, focused on to make sure they bring it into what they're doing today. And we did something again this year, uh, this is after the pandemic. Um, and uh, one of the, so this was called Thriving in AI, where we went across different industries, right? Government to manufacturing technology, be whatnot. And uh, some of the key things, right? Uh, again, I'll be happy to share this, this study with you all. But one of the most important uh, things that started getting traction, at least in a few, uh, especially in government and healthcare was around, how do I um, protect right, uh, my data? How do I prevent threats? Because my AI models can be 
compromised. Uh, how do I know it is resilient enough so it doesn't get uh, attacked through res uh, adversarial attacks and be whatnot? How do I address issues, bias issues in my models? And it is not a one-time check mark done, it's on a continuous basis. So these kind of get to what is, um, I have to do this, right? Everybody's saying I have to do this. Now, how you go about doing this? And even before that, what do you even do to how to, to measure AI, to evaluate AI, to scale it and make sure it is trusted? And before we go there, right? First is what is the risk of not doing this? Again, this over time and over, right? We have seen a um, lot of, uh, enterprises have spent billions of dollars uh, fixing their brand reputation or fixing their uh, uh, or, or paying fines, whether it is a lack of regulatory compliance or whether it is um, lack of brand tarnishment. Right? I don't have to give the examples, but there are there are risks of not doing this, whether it is in terms of risk financially or reputation, uh, legal and other things. Now let's go into how do we actually, what is my starting framework to how do we actually start to make or build this trusted AI? Again, you would have seen this with several others. There is always uh, four, four higher level categories. Some say six, some say eight, but we kind of settled down to, okay, there are four key things. When you are building AI or analytical models, you've got to start to consider and look at. Uh, integrity, which is around where am I getting the data from? Who is training the model? Um, and is the model, the person who's training the model, is, is, he, is he or she qualified enough to train? Is there any uh, by, imbalance in the data that I'm bringing in to train the model, be whatnot? Explainability, the name says it. Can the model explain its decisions? Um, can it also explain the counterfactuals? You apply for a loan, the model says don't, don't give the person the loan what should have happened for the loan to be approved? So can the model say that? Because a human being can say that, right? Oh, you didn't have enough uh, down payment or you don't, you, have, you don't have enough job experience. Then fairness, fairness is around, is there bias in the data? And the million dollar question is, how do you quantify bias? There are known techniques from economics that we can borrow to quantify bias then it's not a one-time thing. How do I continuously look at what is happening to my model? Is there a drift? Is there a bias coming in and be whatnot? And resiliency is about how do I protect the model? How do I prevent it from getting attacked through resiliency? Or, I'm sorry, through adversarial attacks and be whatnot. So this is a general framework that we adopted. Now to bring this to life, right? Let's start with the demo. Maybe this will bring um, this some of the concepts to life. So imagine there is a you're running a business. You hired a bunch of AI modelers and data scientists to come and build models. They've built models. It's being built into applications. Um, you want to know, uh, because I'm going into a board meeting because there is an issue brewing about my company. How do I even know what is happening? What got built? What is happening in my model? So if I switch over to that, right? So what you're seeing is a sanitized version of things we have done for our customers. So what we call this the um, uh, the AI in control dashboard, right? So this is like meant for business users. So if I'm, like I said, if I'm a line of business, I come in, I, I have multiple AI models because I own multiple applications. I want to know what are all the issues. I want to know all bad things that may be going on not to be a pessimist, but I want to know all the issues that are going on. Like the network monitoring that all of us are used to saying. So here, here are these numbers indicate instances of issues. So I have 32 instances of non-compliant features. Because when you build AI, you're going to have data, data have features. Some features are allowed to use, not allowed to use. Maybe if you are an enterprise, you may decide I'm not going to use gender as a feature in training my models because it's my bias. So if that be the case, then if somebody went ahead and used it, how would you know? How, did they, how do you know if they used a proxy for, let's say, age? Instead of using age, they may use generation as a proxy to age. So how do I know those kind of things are happening or not happening? Then other things like, oh, 11 of them are missing business requirements. Um, 11 are not being monitored for accuracy. So these are all 
kind of bubbling up of the top level risks that I have uh, as a business owner, I need to understand. And I can start to kind of uh, drill in at this time. So I can go into looking at, okay, all the models that I have deployed or I have under my purview. So I'm being asked about this next best offer uh, because that is lending or giving out credit card recommendations and people are complaining that it's biasing against a particular gender or particular type of uh, community. Then I can go in and find, okay, where is the model deployed? Who is responsible for it? When was it last updated? And that this metadata about the model itself, it's taken for granted, but it's very, very useful to understand, um, to when I, especially when I'm trying to, under, uh, to get down to the bottom of it. And then currently, what is the current runtime usage for this model? Uh, what is the current accuracy? Uh, who, who are all, how many people are using it? What is the concept of model drift? The drift is an indication of how updated or how current the model is with respect to the data it was trained on. Then there are a couple of exceptions that have been surfaced up and I could drill into uh, what they are, right? Uh, and look at, okay, how the model got um, assessed and uh, understand more detail. So this is one example of how you could bring to life, right? Um, for a business owner, an AI model that got built and deployed, but what is actually happening? What is the macro level view of everything that surrounds it, including data, the tests that have been done, issues that have been surfaced up? So now I can go start to act on. If this were to be your North Star, how do you get there? This is one of the way, one of the North Stars, I'm not saying this is the North Star, this is one of the North Stars that you can, you can strive towards to have like that trusted AI, scalable AI platform per se. So if I go back, um, now if I can start to look at what does that modern AI life cycle start to look like? Right? How do you go about training these models? So let's methodically walk through. So it all starts with, you, you, you need to have a, a business case, right? Or you have to have a use case or you need to have uh, in an agile parlay, right? Epics and features. Why are you even doing this? This is not right. I mean, this is not a science experiment. I mean, there are science experiments, no pun intended, for folks who are in the academia on the call. But uh, in the real world, right, there are real needs. You are trying to build a model that can recommend credit cards, or you can. You're building a model that will recommend, um, for example, if a loan should be approved or not approved, um, or uh, the, you're building a conversational chatbot, right, that can converse with customers. So there are different use cases. So you basically start with, okay, I know my business use case or use cases. I know I have this raw data at hand. It could, it's not just one, right? It could be multiple sources of them. And from them, there is usually a cleansing, pre-processing, validation of the data to prepare uh, what is called um, the training data. So, AI models are taught, you give it examples. Um, and you know, people say AI learns by magic, it's still not there yet. You still need somebody to give it labeled data. So you have to give it pictures of cats and dogs. Somebody has to say, this is a cat, this is a dog. Uh, if anybody says it can automatically make it up, please don't believe them. It's not there yet. Um, there is advanced research, of course, happening. But uh, the label data is a very, very critical aspect where somebody looks at the raw data, labels it, um, selects the features that are important. Um, then feature engineering can be automated through deep learning techniques, neural techniques, but nevertheless, it is important to make sure from a compliance perspective, you're not using features you're not supposed to use. Uh, for example, state of New York has said, if you're a life insurer, you cannot use disability status, um, gender, and a couple more things as features when you're using algorithms to decide on the premium. So this is a law, right? If you, you have to comply with the law. So you have to know what features to select and not select. So the goal of start, starting from the raw data is to end up with the train and test data and once you get here, this is a lot of work typically in an AI 
um, life cycle and people who have built models can appreciate how much of time you would have spent right cleaning up and preparing uh, the training data. So you train, you split them into train and test, then uh, you go select your algorithms. There are tools and techniques out there that can pick the right algorithm, right? There is auto ML, auto machine learning or auto AI that's picking up steam where it says, don't worry about algorithm. I'll pick the best algorithm for you. Um, I'll, I'll choose the one that has the best uh, metrics, whether it is whether it is recall, precision, F1 scores, whatever you're interested in. Then you end up with a trained model. So what you're seeing here is typically, right, we've been doing these things for ages. We go there and deploy the model and all those things. But to kind of start to overlay some modern things, right? So there is this concept of model evaluation. Again, not new, not, not old, uh, not, I'm sorry, not new. You still look at your confusion matrix. You look at uh, what my model performance is through metrics like precision, recall, false positives, right? Which is kind of built into precision and recall. And then you say, okay, I'm gonna go back and adjust. So this is a cycle, right? Uh, again, the cycle has been done. There are methodologies like CRISP DM that kind of goes through, right? All of these, 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 uh, these phases and activities. But to kind of bring in some of the modern constructs, so a couple of things I want to point out. So when you do the cleansing and pre-validation, this, this talk about bias, right? The algorithm is not biased, right? Because you're, you're, you're telling it to learn from data. It's actually the data that causes bias in the AI model. So if I give it, so for example, if I'm building a credit card recommendation model, should I approve, should I give the person a credit card or not? I'm gonna give it examples of past applications, which ones were applied and which ones, I'm sorry, which ones were approved and which ones were rejected. So let's say I picked up credit cards only for people who make a certain income and above and don't give the model data about other income levels. And obviously when the model gets deployed and if a person comes in with a lower or a higher income, it might reject that person. Because you're, you're inherently biasing your system or inherently biasing the AI model to not learn from a stratified sample. So there is validation of data to make sure there is distribution, there is no imbalance and everything. And also when you have trained the model and you are, you are, you are now ready, right? There is something called peer reviews or automated reviews. And within those automated reviews, you check for bias, you check for imbalances, you check for if the model can explain its decisions, you check for regulatory compliance. And typically, uh, at least the, the way we are doing it at KPMG is we are automating all of this. So we are saying, look, there are a set of tests you need to go run and you define thresholds. So for example, if you have something like bias, I'm gonna run three tests. I'm gonna do a Thiel index, I'm gonna do an average odds difference and maybe something one more. And I know if the value is below uh, close to minus one or the value is close to plus one, if there's a bias that is happening with my reference group or with my monitor group and view or not. Not to get into the science of all of those metrics, but there are very, very specific tests for each one of these, rather than saying I'm gonna test for bias, very, very quantifiable discrete tests that you go run and make sure um, if they pass or don't pass. If they don't pass, I go back to the drawing board and redo the whole thing. So this is a major, probably I would say net new that you introduce into your AI life cycle to make it trusted, to make it scalable, right? And now you can stand behind all the decisions, right? The model might make after you deploy it, where you're now building, again, the, the AI runtime or the AI serving environment you could have a separate session. I can talk about that, right? What it takes to deploy these models, how it can be served up as APIs, how do you protect and 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 uh, and uh, uh, test these models for adversarial attacks and be whatnot. So there is a deployment part, and also there is something net new which is emerging, and people have started to do is the concept of model registry. So that metadata about the models that I showed you earlier, who was built it, when was it last updated, what data was used, uh, what were the decisions that went along, 
for the model to get deployed. The whole thing has to be in a model registry so you can understand the lineage and everything that goes on with that model. So this is something that new. If you don't have this, this is like you, you've deployed something, you don't even know what it is doing. You don't even know what, if an issue comes up and if you go back to that North Star demo I was showing, right? This helps me get to that level of info. So all the experiments, all the data, all the decisions and all the tests that were done end up in the model registry to go along with, okay, what that model is. Then you've got the, the most important part, um, at least in my opinion, which is you deploy the model. So the model is being put to use. It's used by applications. It is used to make lending decisions. It is used to make product recommendations and be whatnot. How do you know that it is not doing something wrong in when it is running? So this aspect of continuous monitoring, this is not new in IT, right? We always had systems that do continuous monitoring of our infrastructure, but that same concept for AI, how do I do continuous monitoring of my AI models for things like drift? The drift could be around model, could be on the data. So the difference is the data that I use to train the model, if, if it becomes different from what is actually coming in from, from, from real life, and I do a comparison, if there is a difference, then I have a data drift. And, no, my, 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 and inherently my model is, is no longer valid because what I trained it on is different from what is becoming out there. I mean, we, we saw this a lot in the pandemic um, where before the pandemic, the models were trained using some data. And now after the pandemic, all of our behaviors changed. All of our financial situations changed. So many models became obsolete if not, um, right? So we had to go and make sure there is drift detection, both on the data side, concept side, and the model side happening continuously. Then there is bias. Biases, how do I make sure there is no bias creep? Because many AI systems have this continuous tuning and refinement. So I don't want somebody to kind of bring in the bias into the system based on the runtime data that they're bringing. Then, checking for explanations, checking for counterfactuals, checking for key risk indicators. So this is again, more very, very important. And if things go wrong, you come back to the drawing board and repeat the cycle. So I'm sure there are other things I could have added to this picture, but this is kind of like a distilled view of how you build these AI systems, but also how do you start to inject some of the trusted aspects into the life cycle um, and why you need to do them, uh, where you need to do them, what does the feedback look, start to look like, and, uh, and whatnot. Now, building on that aspect of what do you actually measure, so I talked about the four, the four uh, trust anchors, integrity, explainability, fairness, and resilience. Um, now, to double click, let me come back to this, to double click, into that, right? And I'll share this deck with, with everybody. Um, what you're seeing is that matrix of uh, what do you actually do? What are the, so this is our framework we use. It's a representative list of things we test for or check for or try to automate um, using different automation, DevOps, pipelines, and be whatnot. But these are the kind of tests. So when you're deploying AI models, you're going to have some kind of um, code automation, right? DevOps automation, CI, CD automation. So if you think about each of these bullet points as, okay, with an integrity, I'm gonna have a step for, uh, for the in design, I'm gonna use for data, data quality and cleansing. That could be a discrete set of tests that you could have in your CI, CD pipeline or a stage in your CI, CD pipeline. And you can define thresholds for what passes and what fails. So all of these are a combination of tests that you run, tests that you can automate. And if you implement something like this, I'm not saying go do this, but implement something like this, you are moving towards having a trusted and a more scalable AI because you have more control over what you're actually not only building, but knowing what the models are doing for you and how it is uh, making decisions so that and, and other things so that you could you could have more control. So um, 
So again, going back, right? And what are those discrete tests? Again, I, I, I presented a few of several hundred tests that are in the catalog that we do. So for example, in, in, the, in the data rights category, right? From, from data integrity, where are you getting the data from? Do you have the rights to use the data? Are you using it from a source that you are not supposed to use? A good metaphor and analogy is when we go crawl websites, we have this thing called robots.txt. It's almost like a honor system, right? If you see uh, in the robots.txt, do not scan or do not crawl, then the crawlers don't crawl them because it's, a, it's an agreement to say, look, please don't crawl me. So very similarly, if, you're, if you don't have access to data, you're not supposed to use the data, but you still went about using it to train your models, then you have an issue. So going and testing, you have in your, in your, in your CSV pipelines, do I have the rights to use it, right, is one. Then data quality is, is, do I have duplicates? Do I have missing values? Do I have imbalance towards a particular uh, feature value, um, right? Is it a train test distribution imbalance? I go check for that. And target features, how distributed are they, except for a very, so credit card fraud is a different scenario, but most of the other conditions, if I have more imbalance uh, across my classes, then I produce uh, a flag. Then bias check, I talked about, right? Uh, average odds difference, do a Thiel index. And then for average odds, for example, if it is less than zero, uh, your privileged group is getting a higher benefit. So there is bias towards them. Or if it is greater than zero, it's the, it's the contrary, right? You're, you're, you're trying to make it more towards the unprivileged group and biasing against your privileged group. So it's like a balance you have to maintain an ideal value of being like zero. So this is the way to quantify bias. Um, then Thiel index, disallowed features, right? Or all other things you can do to quantify. Then you're doing other types of tests like independent model validation using test, hold, and see how much of the false positives are when you compare the train and test. Then um, you do explainability checks. You can define explainability schemas and see how well it matches um, then model serving and you test for SSI injection or you know, parameter pollution tests, other kinds of resiliency tests that you can run. So again, this is not the universe of everything. This is a few sample, but this is like things you have to put to work in, in building any scalable software system, all of us do QA. What you're seeing is QA for AI, if I could put it that way. Then these are screenshots from the tools that we have built. Uh, again, this is an anonymous data set for the purposes of this discussion. But I'm, I'm analyzing the source data, looking for quality, whether it is measuring things at the column level, feature level. Um, how is the variability on the data? If it is low variability, then it means that the data is not just wide enough, right? It is too narrow. Uh, it's not stratified then um, it also tells things like redundancy, right? If you don't have highly redundant data, um, then it, it may not give you like a highly um, uh, generalizable model per se. Then bias detection, you, you get samples of the report, right? In terms of what tests passed and what tests failed. And here you are basing, you're testing for bias on this anonymized feature uh, and we are saying my reference value is greater than 23.23 and anything below 23.23 is my monitor. So think about in a very simple example, my reference group could be in gender, could be male, and my monitored group could be female. So that's, the, that's how you do bias, right? With respect to my male, is are females getting biased or vice versa? Or in an age group, any, anybody over, over 55 is my monitor and my reference is people between 30 and 45. So am I biasing people over 55, right? And what is the favorable in, outcome and what is not the favorable outcome? So from a bias, it gets multidimensional. You got to get down to this level to then say, okay, then you get to what is my quantified values for each of them. So again, there are these are these these techniques have existed for a few decades. We are not making them up now. All you're seeing is how we are bringing them into the fold of operationalized AI. Then explainability checks. There are many many ways to do it. 
there are surrogate tests, there are black box tests, um, there is uh, there are common techniques like SHAP and uh, SHAP values, right? Um, which tells you what impact does a feature have on the model outcome at a local level and also at a global level. Not to get into the theory of uh, how explainability checks work, but explainability checks really work in terms of, okay, tell me what you're doing as a model. How did you come up with this decision? And how important was that? So for example, in a loan prediction, if it says age, gender, and income were the top three contributing factors, um, what would it mean if this person made a few thousand dollars more or less? That's when you get into the next thing called counterfactuals. What should have happened the model to have flipped this decision the other way around? So I know you have the top four important features, so what should have happened to, for the model to have made a decision in the other way? So again, these are all things that you could automate and uh, quantify and uh, look at right what it is actually doing. Um, I know how we're doing on time. I got five more minutes before I can take questions. I want to show another demo, right, to bring these abstract, probably way concepts to life. So this scenario is where uh, imagine you are running a data science team and you are responsible for building trusted, scalable AI models. And uh, that model registry, remember I talked about in the, in the life cycle, so if I go back to the life cycle, um, you had this thing on the top called model registry, which is a very tiny box, but it looks tiny, but it's very important. What I'm trying to get to is, I'm trying to do a quote unquote audit of what actually happened for when a model got deployed, because I'm being asked questions. I want to do quality control. I want to do code reviews, call it whatever, right? So I come here, what I'm seeing are, uh, we call this the AI prominence tool, which we do for our clients and ourselves. So I can, for example, go into this loan prediction model, then I get the metadata about what that model is, okay? I get a description of what that is. Um, and we actually patented using blockchain as a way to um, create a consensus, right? If it is a multi-party involved in training a model. So you can have a blockchain hash. But the most important point is, you, you know who the owner is, who are the subject matter experts who are involved in providing the training data, who are the data scientists, who reviewed it. And then the phases that the model went, so let's say I had a methodology, crisp DM-like. These are all the phases the model went through. It's currently deployed. Uh, it's deployed on Watson ML, uh, right? It was last updated on this date. And this is my, uh, accuracy and other things, right? But I'm more interested in, okay, what actually happened, right, from start to finish? Um, I'm pretty sure, unless you're very disciplined, you may not have a consolidated view like this. Starting with the business requirements were reviewed on 1.3, and it was approved by this person, then going to, um, data sources finalized, data usage guidelines negotiated. Then I acquired the raw data, ran quality checks. Then I did data cleansing. Then I did feature engineering and I was approved by this person. Then I checked for bias. I checked for the features and they were approved for use and Sammy was the person who put a rubber stamp on it. Um, right, I don't have to read the list, but it goes, through all the phases and I'm, if let's say I'm interested in what happened in the modeling phase, I can go look at who, what algorithm was selected. I can go and drill into each one of these and go into the level of details. This is the North Star, right? This is the North Star for scalable AI where you're documenting pretty much everything uh, that you're doing, not only for the sake of documenting, but for the sake of what actually transpired in that step. And you wanna get to a level of automation with these. and once I know this, right, if there is an issue with parameter tuning that was performed after the model was deployed, I can go now talk to the person I want. Or I can go look at, okay, who are all the applications that are using this model? So this is a knowledge graph of 
you have three apps that are using this model. And uh, if I have to make a change, I know the impacts of doing it. Or if I want to know the model metrics, get a snapshot of the kernel model, model metrics, I can go get this uh, and do it. Or if I want to go look at the data that was used to train the model, I can go get to it. So you can come in from any direction you want, but this is giving me that entire lineage provenance and traceability with respect to what actually happens. To get to this level, you need that scalable pipeline or automation now. So um, again, uh, in terms of going back to why you have to do this, how you do this, uh, there is another angle through which um, some of the customers we work with also come and ask, hey, look, I get this AI, all this thing, all great, but what does it mean to me? I'm more worried about risks for as an enterprise. So we look at this from the risk, key risk indicators perspective. There are regulations that are coming up emerging every day that goes by, there's a new regulation that is being published. So we look, we kind of Mac bubble this up to key risk indicators and say, here are some key risks that you have to start to track. For example, uh, if lack of business case, that's a key risk. If you don't have a business case and you still went ahead and built and deployed the model, that's a big red flag. Or the model is failing interpret interpretability tests because you and if it is failing, I don't even know if I can use it. It's my regulations say I cannot use models that cannot, that don't have explainability to them. So this is another way to look at what you need to do and then translate these into tests and uh, automation that you can, you can do. Um, kind of get to uh, closure, right? I mean, here is a sampling of tools. I mean, don't think you're, you're gonna use pen and paper to do all of this. There's a lot of work, a lot of activity happening um, out there, including in the open source community, as well as in the commercial world. Um, so I've tried to kind of give a sampling of the tools and libraries, the most common popular ones. So for example, if you want to assess bias in your models, uh, IBM Watson has a tool, Arthur AI, Fiddler AI, these are all commercial tools. They have tools that, they, and IBM, for example, is open sourced AI Fairness 360, uh, right? So you can use these tools to kind of provide your data um, and it kind of uh, quantifies and comes up with different metrics, right? To check if there's bias in your model. Or if you are trying to do explainability, Lyman Shap is the most popular, uh, it's open source. Um, I saw uh, True Era open source their uh, uh, vision, one of the computer vision explainability uh, capabilities. So if you have, uh, you have a computer vision model that can tell cats and dogs, it will tell you why it detected something as a cat or a dog. So that's explainability. Uh, so anyway, uh, and then there is ML flow and cube flow that kind of bring everything together to give you that methodology that you can adopt to kind of, when you build these AI models and put them to production. So, so to summarize, uh, testing, evaluating AI models is, is different. Uh, you need both runtime and design time validation. You need to test for things like fairness, bias, integrity, which you may have never done in the past. Then continuous monitoring is required. This is not a one-time job. Then you need to understand the provenance of actions you have taken so that you can stand behind what the models are doing. And continuous governance is something that is often underappreciated, but it is very much needed for uh, for for AI. Uh, then explainability of model decisions, lineage of experiments you've done, lineage of data that you use to train the models, who touched it, who synthesized it. Then uh, testing the model for adversarial attacks and the award not. Right, those are all important. So I'll take a pause here. Happy to take questions, um, comments, critique. So Swami, this is Tony, I'll start with one. Um, how much are you seeing in terms of attention from board level and senior executive levels versus liabilities and risks that they have to pay attention to in this area? 
Yeah, fantastic question, Tony, right? So we do see, um, so every, every organization, every enterprise has this construct of an internal audit, right? So this is your internal auditor who tries to make sure you're doing things the right way. So no offense to them, right? That they, they keep trying to keep your, the lights on. They're trying to make sure you do follow principles and procedures. So there is one by or one attention from them because they're always interested to make sure, look, you're not doing something wrong. You're not something you're supposed to do as an enterprise and cause my brand or my organization to get tarnished outside. This is getting a lot of board attention now. And simply because a lot have ended up paying a few billion dollars with a B fine. So to name a few, right? Uh, Facebook with their whole uh, Cambridge Analytica, they had to pay billions of dollars of fine. And um, so they're doing a lot of things to kind of rectify that. Then Amazon had issues where their, their uh, models that were used in recruiting was biasing against people who did not have a college degree and they had to shut it down and that caused a brand issue, right? So uh, they, everybody is worried about that, but still there is no trigger point, unlike in financial services where there are regulations. In healthcare and financial services, there are regulations. So they are more concerned that boards are always, they always have been doing model risk management for a long time. But in other industries, there is no law or regulation, but it is emerging. It's gonna be a matter of time where some of the local state and federal and local governments are gonna put some mandates and say, look, you have to comply. Then it becomes the law and you have to follow. So short answer to your question, there is a tension. Um, some are forward thinkers in trying to do this. Um, and uh, some have gone to the level of saying, I have an ethics AI ethics policy and I'm now going to take it to the next level of making it actionable. And uh, not all of them are doing, but very few are doing that. Thank you. I would like to ask a question too. If, uh, um, so I've really seen this a lot, especially in, um, the HR processes um, and a lot of companies where, I mean, both internal with HR and they're going through all these services from Indeed, Glassdoor, and I'm not, and I'm, you know, like I said, I'm not knocking them, I'm just saying that people are going through these where it's, it's, I don't know if it's so much of a bias as it is um, a, a structural issue where these, these types of HR things are looking for certain things, certain keywords. And of course, I, you know, we know as technology people, they have to, but um, there's a lot of good candidates. There's a lot of people where they're being filtered out. Um, you know, I, I, I remember there was an article where someone wrote an AI program to make their, um, their submissions and they did this kind of as an experiment to match up to exactly what they were looking for and they were still getting filtered out even though they were intentionally trying to um, you know match those things and so um, it seems like there's a big disconnect in that in that particular realm with with AI in because you're dealing with humans on top of you know these um, structural issues where they have hard gates, you know, on these filters. So what do you see in that kind of realm? Because that seems to be a really, really big issue right now. So it's a great question. I, I completely agree with you. So the, the, the way I'm interpreting your question is, it's very related to what we're talking here, but it's a slightly different category, which is you have these AI models that are being used in recruiting and scanning through resumes and profiles and be whatnot. It's simply not doing the job, right? Or it is, it is dropping candidates on the floor because um, it was trained by somebody. That person tried to bring in their thinking into what the model should look for probably. And uh, so you have a bias happening. It is, it is not causing harm and damage I would say this carefully, it's causing harm and damage to people who are applying for a job, 
but not like the scenario where somebody is applying for a loan or a car getting rejected because that may have some impact on their livelihood, right? So your point is, it is still issue, right? The issue is basically how the models got trained, how wide was that model training data? Was it trying to pick up, for example, all profiles, all candidates who may have said the same thing in different ways? I may not have, I may not have had to use the same English words or phrases, but somebody else so happened to use it, but the model picked up somebody else's and not mine. That was not my mistake. That was basically the mistake of the person who trained the model. So it goes back to this, this thing I was talking about earlier, which is the balance, the data quality, how variable, how widely spread out is your data. So it is not kind of narrow fitting or underfitting something. Right, there's overfitting. You don't want to have too much of variance. You don't have to have very less variance. So you've got to have a balance. So long story short, your point is valid. It kind of brings out the data quality and the bias issues um, that has to be kind of incorporated into the whole life cycle development. No, thank you. Appreciate your uh, insight. Any any questions? I know this 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 topic is uh, is like okay. I'm 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 not even starting getting started with AI, but the way I tell my customers are look, this is not an after after thing, right? It's not an after afterthought. You've got to if you're starting with AI, doing AI, or about to start AI, it's better you start to think about these constructs, right? Uh, as and when you get started, because at some point in time, somebody's going to come and ask you for this, these type of questions or somebody's going to challenge you. So the question Michael asked, if I were the CEO of Indeed and I come and tell, hey, data science team, one of my customers, is, one of our customers are coming and complaining us. We, are, we, don't, we, don't, we seem to be dropping a lot of computer science candidates. And uh, they went and hired them still, but outside of our platform, they're going to stop using Indeed. Now people start giving attention. Right, so um, it, it 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 is going to become it is going to become more and more amplified as more and more AI models are going to be built and deployed. This level of visibility is going to be needed. Swami, so, mean, in some industries, it's cheaper to pay the fine than it is to fix the problem. Do you see, for yeah. example, in Facebook and some of the others that have already received fines that it's there is a, from their perspective, it's easier just to pay the fine than to go fix the problem. I see. I mean, I I, I work with all, all. I work with Facebook. I do work with Google's of the world. I don't think they're trying to get away from this in in the true nature. I mean, they 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 want to address the problem. The problem space is so big um, that. They. I mean, even for if you think about this, right? Even for somebody like Facebook who actually contribute a lot back to the community, whether it is AI research and open sourcing some of their models and be whatnot, um, things do happen. So it's more of procedural operational policies that get dropped on the floor rather than they're saying, okay, you know what, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna turn a blind eye to this and I'll pay a fine. I don't think they're doing that. I don't think in the true nature, in the true intent, they wanna do that. It's just that things fall apart somewhere. And, uh, and, and that's why right, at least I get engaged, right? To come and help them look at all those things and see how we can avoid those kind of things happening. Thank you. Swami, just an observation here. You you were showing the the bias uh, screen where it looks like it was um, like a rules based approach to validate what's coming out of the model, and I, I just I find it interesting because we we went from deterministic rules based approaches to AI to solve problems that we ordinarily couldn't, but now we're back to validating AI using 
rules-based approaches. Do you, do you find that interesting at all? I, I do, I do. And and uh, fair disclosure, uh, it's a good catch. Like it's, I don't think deterministic approaches are going to go away. Um, at some point in time, if everything is still, so this is like adding, compounding the problem, right? You're testing an AI model, but you're still using another AI model to test the AI model. How do I trust the AI model that is testing my AI model? It's so it's so convoluted, right? So at one at some point, um, I think to start to ground things, we say, okay, can I use the ML technique to test for bias? Absolutely, yes. There are techniques out there, but to kind of baseline and ground things, what if I told you I evaluated the data that you used to train the model? I ran these three tests, and by the way, those three tests produce very very discrete values. And I have a rule or a threshold where I say anything above, below, or on par is going to pass fail or neutral. Um, so it helps me ground this to a level, but there is nothing stopping you from bringing in other inferencing techniques, non-deterministic inferencing techniques to check for bias. But it's a very valid point, right? This is surely for the matter of, look, how far do I take this? Um, and at some point, right, if you are a business user, I, I have to bring it down to their level, right, rather than making it all inference based. Thank you. Yeah. How about you, Bruce? Do you have any comments, thoughts? If Bruce is still on. Anyone else? Comments, feedback? Well, this has been very helpful information, Swami. I really appreciate the level of detail that you presented the information. It wasn't too complex or too simple. It was kind of just right, like Goldilocks and the three bears. <laughs> it was just right so that you could understand it, get a feel for the concepts of how it works. But if you had never dealt with it, you weren't overwhelmed. And so I appreciate that level of detail that you went into today. Thank you. And, and I'll, I'll share this presentation. And uh, if there are more questions, conversations we need to have, please feel free to reach out to me and uh, happy, to, happy to take them. Well, that's terrific. Thank you so much, Swami. Thank you so much, Tony Corrado, for introducing us to Swami and for providing such a great presentation. And I hope everybody has a terrific day. Thank, Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thanks, Swami. Bye-bye, guys.